whole community approach. So each of you that are taking the time uh, to, to dial in or watch today online uh, or watching this at a later date, uh, we appreciate your investment in time because uh, educated citizenry is going to be uh, key to us achieving our objective of saving lives. And again, uh, starting from the top in terms of strategy, uh, the goal uh, that we have is to try to slow the rate of infection of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we're experiencing. Uh, as we know from uh, taking a look at other states and other countries uh, who are experiencing a, a rapid steep increase uh, in cases, uh, as we've seen in Italy, now we're seeing this in New York, we're seeing it in California, uh, that's a, a lens into the future. People might say, we don't know what's gonna happen, but uh, this there's not anyone that has a, a not any geography in the world that is gonna be immune uh, to having this pandemic arrive on its doorstep. It is here in North Dakota. We do have community spread uh, and we're gonna to continue to see uh, more cases coming. And the right now in a world where there's no, uh, no vaccine, uh, the best way for us to approach this is to slow uh, the, the rate of transmission. And while we cannot change the, the nature and the character of the virus in terms of how contagious the virus is, we can change our own behavior to reduce the likelihood of, of transmission. And when we reduce the, the likelihood of transmission, uh, then we, as we've been saying, uh, flatten the curve. Uh, we have an opportunity to stay below the line of what our capacity is uh, for uh, medical services. So we're working this uh, problem in two ways. If the goal is to save lives, there's two things we're doing. One is all the social distancing policies, uh, which slow the rate of transmission. And on the other side, uh, we've got task force working very hard about what do we do to make sure that we've got enough beds, enough personnel, uh, enough ventilators, enough equipment to be able to handle the crunch uh, when it may arrive here as it has arrived in other states. So it's a classic supply and demand. We're trying to uh, you know, reduce uh, the demand for medical services by slowing the rate of, of transmission. And we're trying to increase the supply uh, by working on all the aspects of the supply chain uh, to make sure that we have that capability. So again, and the strategy for working both sides of this uh, is to uh, save lives. And so again, as we've said multiple times this week, uh, this is, has a, a uh, higher than the flu mortality rate uh, for elderly and those that are at, at risk due to chronic underlying underlying health issues, and that could represent as much as 20% of the population of North Dakota being at risk. So, those of you that are that are practicing uh, what we call uh, being North Dakota smart, uh, you are our heroes. Thank you for your not only your compliance, thanks for your proactivity, uh, thanks for doing everything you can to keep uh, you, not only your family, uh, your neighbors, your employees safe, but you're doing that for people that you may not even know. So that's the high level strategy. Uh, today, North Dakota Department of Health uh, confirmed seven additional cases of the novel coronavirus or COVID-19, and that includes at least one more additional case of community spread. Uh, that means six of those cases either have not yet been confirmed community or they were confirmed travel. The seven new cases uh, came across four different counties, two more in Burley County, three in Morton County, one in Ramsey County, and one in uh, Pierce County. Uh, and in uh, Pierce County, uh, that would be in North Central uh, North Dakota, People might think of that as one of our rural counties, but I would just use this as a an indication for those people in our rural area that think that this is something that only happens in areas of larger population like New York or California or in larger cities like Fargo or Bismarck. Uh, as we've seen uh, in other parts of the world, this has the ability to spread uh, to even the most rural parts of uh, countries or nations, and it will has the potential to spread to the most rural areas in North Dakota. Uh, yesterday, we announced that there we had our first hospitalization. Uh, we have a second individual, so now we have two individuals in North Dakota who are hospitalized. And, and of course, we uh, our thoughts and prayers are with anybody who has not only contracted this, but finds himself in a position uh, where it's become a serious illness. Uh, totals to date uh, through the North Dakota Department of Health, 938 tested, 912 negative to the 26 positive. And we have uh, substantially ramped up our, our testing 
uh, capacity, and we're going to continue to do that heading into next week. We've yesterday uh, the 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 we had 12 new cases out of 311 tests. Today we had seven new cases out of 265, and the, that's the seven that we're reporting today. So the good news is that we had fewer new cases today than we had the day before, uh, and hopefully what this means is that steps we're taking to encourage social distancing. Uh, is helping to slow the spread of COVID-19 uh, and slow the growth rate of positive cases. Uh, the bad news uh, is that we had two additional counties uh, in addition to Pierce uh, and Ramsey. And for those that are not uh, don't have their North Dakota maps uh, at hand, uh, the county seat of Pierce is Rugby and the county seat of Ramsey is Devil's Lake. Uh, but those are two new counties where they now have reported uh, cases. Uh, again, uh, this leads us to our uh, to the uh, understanding that our entire state has to practice social distancing. And again, number one, uh, if you're at all not feeling well, uh, please stay home if you're sick, uh, even if it's if it's if it's minor. Uh, but having said all that, again, North Dakota remains well prepared and well positioned uh, to deal with this because we are one of the last places uh, in North America where it's going to where it's reaching. And so, again, we can look at other states that are weeks ahead of us and see uh, see what our future may hold. And we know that in other other states, they are having uh, situations of really strains on terms of their capacity uh, in in terms of the in terms of capacity, in terms of medical facilities. We've talked before about exponential growth and what that could mean. And when things double and keep doubling, uh, that's when things uh, get really stressed. Uh, it took over three months for the world to experience 100,000 cases of COVID-19. It took only 12 days for the world to experience the next 100,000 cases of COVID-19. Uh, it, 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 again, then you can understand how you can, if that, that as that doubling may continue, uh, that quickly uh, we're in a situation where we're really stressed for, for resources. So again, the planning that's going on today, the precautions that are going on today uh, are, are likely going to give us the capacity to help us get through this. Uh, the, and just for, for those that are the, the press that are here, uh, that are here that are and others that are asking uh, coronavirus is not taking the weekend off neither are we any of us that are working uh, in state government those that are working as part of the unified command across all of our different uh, work streams uh, the will continue to be working throughout the weekend uh, and we'll also be having uh, press briefings uh, tomorrow uh, at 4 p.m. and Sunday at 4 p.m. for those that are in the press or those that are watching online uh, Yesterday, uh, I signed an executive order uh, which was deregulatory in nature and, and helped uh, us work on the capacity side of the problem. How do we make sure that when the crunch comes that we have enough health care workers to work in North Dakota? Uh, and that executive order allowed that if someone was appropriately licensed in other state, they could work in North Dakota. Uh, we're, we've expanded that uh, executive order today uh, to include uh, one more category of workers, and that's uh, folks that work in radiology and medical imagery, including uh, you know the, the med tech or the radiology techs that would work in that. And again, this helps us on the supply side to make sure that we have enough uh, personnel. Uh, we also uh, have, as part of that same executive order, expanded the order to, to allow for expanded services across our state through telehealth. Uh, telehealth has been around for a long time, but as a lot of things in the health industry, highly regulated, uh, and what we're doing is cutting through lots of red tape uh, to allow more uh, fields of medicine to be able to practice through telehealth. And I want to give a shout out uh, to our uh, independently elected uh, North Dakota Insurance Commissioner, John Godfried, uh, who's been working uh, uh, shoulder to shoulder with us on this. And he's working on changing a bunch of, uh, of rules within the uh, deregulation on the insurance side uh, to expand what telehealth activities could actually be reimbursed. Uh, and this is again going to allow us to practice social distancing uh, and is also going to help us serve uh, the more rural parts of the state. 
Uh, and again, uh, uh, you know, we, we have the technology to deliver health care and behavioral health services remotely. Uh, we should use it. Uh, perhaps we should be using it all the time, but with this emergency order, uh, it's going to speed up our ability to, to deliver our ability to do that. So again, uh, that's a new executive order on telehealth. Uh, unemployment insurance. We've also got an executive order uh, that's gone out today uh, that is going to dramatically reduce the red tape around applying for unemployment uh, insurance and getting an un unemployment check. We're doing this through executive order. Part of the reason we're doing this, of course, is we know that in addition to the uh, the, the, the health uh, challenge that we're battling. Uh, we know that in the way, you, the way you fight a pandemic when you don't have a vaccine is you fight it through slowing the spread and the way you slow the spread is through social distancing. Uh, but that what that means is we've got a lot of businesses uh, that have either closed voluntarily or with executive orders yesterday being asked to change their business models. Uh, for example, to be able to do, uh, you know, curbside takeout or drive through uh, in the case of restaurants. Uh, so we know that we're creating economic hardship uh, with the decisions we're made to try to protect the health of of our citizens in the state of North Dakota. Uh, but with that uh, is going to come unemployment. And then it's also compounded by the fact uh, that earlier at the beginning of this global uh, pandemic, uh, we did see a demand shock uh, when you start stopping uh, the supply chains with all the ships coming from China to the U.S., when you stop international flights, uh, when people stop commuting to work, uh, you create a demand shock, a drop in demand. And one of the areas where there's been a substantial demand uh, shock drop uh, has been in the use of transportation fuels. North Dakota is the second largest uh, oil producer in the nation uh, has benefited mightily from strong economies and our position of being able to uh, to uh, deliver uh, energy uh, to the world. Uh, but in this case now, when we have a slowdown, then also gets compounded by uh, some international politics between Saudi Arabia and Russia. And we've seen a drop of almost uh, a drop in half in the price of oil prices. And so as a fallout of the global pandemic, uh, we're seeing a drop in price, but that drop in price is causing a number of uh, energy companies that work in North Dakota across all aspects uh, of oil and gas to, to have to think about start doing layoffs. Uh, and so the combination of the demand shock for oil plus uh, the unemployment claims uh, that may be starting to come in from our from executive orders, uh, we're seeing, as we expected, an increase in unemployment claims. We had 418 claims in unemployment of all of last week. So think of that as, as uh, about averaging a week ago about 80 claims a day. Uh, Wednesday of this week, we had 600 claims. Yesterday, 1,600. Uh, so this is a, a trend line uh, which we're likely going to uh, see as we've seen uh, all over the country uh, where the COVID uh, related uh, issues to unemployment, but also the economic fallout related to COVID-19. So again, to the executive order that we've signed today in terms of cutting red tape so people have an easier time filing claims for unemployment benefits during these extraordinary circumstances and these changes in the executive order, which are quite detailed, uh, significantly reduce the administrative workload on our team, because you can imagine a team that was producing 80 Processing 80 a day now facing 1,600 and growing uh, is is quite. And we're trying to reduce the administrative burden so we can process uh, these and get checks out to people faster. Uh, so there's a number of changes that are being made, but at a high level, separation from last employer, which is one of the the, the qualifications uh, that uh, we're we're waiving or reducing requirements there. And the net result of all this is a significantly greater percentage of claims will be paid than under normal circumstances. Circumstances. Uh, this uh, will also reduce the amount of inquiries being sent to employers and claimants uh, because sometimes if there was a claim made, a lot of investigative time to try to, to qualify that claim with all this disruptions, employers may not even be at their place of business to be able to respond uh, to mailings or emails from job service. And so again, taking these steps. I want to thank uh, Brian Clipful, who's in the audience today uh, for his leadership. Uh, he's leading both uh, 
workforce safety insurance right now and job service and want to thank uh, he and his teams uh, but the teams at job service are stepping up to manage uh, unprecedented rapid increase in claims uh, but fortunately this uh, the changes that we're describing here are relatively uh, easy from an IT system be able to implement because no system changes are required uh, and this will this applies to all businesses not just those that were impacted uh, through our executive orders for closure so if anybody anybody in our state is is, uh, recently become unemployed uh, contact job service uh, and for their information this has led to questions about uh, our uh, the size of the unemployment insurance uh, fund uh, and the backstop on the unemployment insurance fund but we've done some checking on that uh, there is the ability uh, that st stands today for states in their unemployment insurance funds to borrow at zero interest from the federal government uh, we with all the action going on in congress we think that that uh, is a uh, likely going to be one of the ways that perhaps uh, dollars will be channeled to states. Lieutenant Governor and I are advocating to all of our federal CODEL and other federal officials at the administrative level that one of the great ways to support states during this time frame would be to channel some of the, uh, the funding uh, that's coming out of Congress into supporting the unemployment uh, system. Uh, and secondly, if that federal backstop isn't enough, uh, there is the uh, existing statutory ability for job service to take a loan out from the bank in North Dakota. So people that are thinking about, uh, about their unemployment benefits should know uh, with confidence uh, that there's going to be funds there to pay those unemployment benefits, uh, either at the federal level or the state level. Uh, Okay, uh, to learn more about this, you can visit the uh, Commerce Department's employer page. Uh, and then Commerce Department and GNDC will be hosting another business briefing call next Thursday, March 26th at 11 a.m. Uh, the GNDC, uh, that would be the Greater North Dakota Chamber. You can find details pertaining to this call at the Commerce Department's employer page. Uh, and again, Job Service North Dakota, if you're looking to learn about unemployment benefits. At that call last week, uh, there was uh, over a thousand uh, people on the call from businesses around the state. Uh, next topic, uh, state agency deadlines and DOT. You know, we are looking uh, across state government for ways to help citizens during these trying times, uh, looking to reduce regulations that get in the way of assisting uh, our citizens and those citizens who are trying to help those that are most vulnerable uh, and those that are seeking uh, to try to continue to do their regular business with the state of North Dakota as we state of North Dakota remains open for business. Uh, we're just trying to deliver those business and agency services uh, in, in, in new ways uh, with many of our workers working remotely. Uh, but with a focus on that service today, I signed an executive order uh, directing all state agencies to identify provisions of law or administrative rules that in any way prevents, hinders, or delays that agency's ability to render maximum assistance or to continue to deliver essential services to citizens during the COVID crisis. Uh, this is a, uh, th as part of this uh, executive order, uh, we're asking that all agencies submit ideas, uh, essentially identifying the constraints that may exist in existing law or existing administrative rules that are preventing them uh, from serving our citizens. And so this is again, uh, trying to take a look at the bureaucracy that exists and how do we cut through it and cut through it rapidly uh, to help those, those citizens and businesses in our state uh, that, are, that may be impaired by the current situation. Uh, you know, the order, it requires state agencies to identify law or regulation that would delay uh, citizens or businesses, for example, for obtaining or renewing any sort of license or certification. Uh, and of utmost importance, uh, we're asking these agencies to look at services related to health, to education, to employment. Uh, so with a special focus on that, uh, we're asking uh, that those agencies submit those to the governor's office. Uh, we are also inviting uh, as part of this executive order, inviting all other elected officials in the state uh, in their offices to do the same, uh, which is if they've got things that other electeds are running into, uh, again, uh, John Godfried, insurance commissioner, been a great example. He's identifying things that were in the way of us providing telehealth. Uh, he brought them to the governor's office. We were unable to include that in the executive order today uh, to create uh, greater ability for us to deliver health care services uh, in a way where we're still practicing social distancing. So we're inviting all the other electeds uh, to follow that lead, uh, and we're, we're requiring all agencies to come forward with ideas. But we know that some of the best ideas 
ideas that we're getting. Uh, we know our office, Brent and I personally, getting calls and texts from citizens and saying, hey, what about this? I tried to do this. I needed to get a license for that. I couldn't do it. Uh, we want to hear those ideas. So all citizens are also uh, invited to submit ideas where government red tape uh, during these uh, times is getting in the way of you doing the things you need to do. And you can submit those to governor at ND. Uh, dot, dot gov. Uh, one example uh, of this is to of, of example of where we're already being proactive along this whole area of trying to reduce and cut through red tape uh, to help our citizens during this time uh, is that we're as part of the executive order today uh, we're uh, ordering that all uh, organizations uh, that provide services uh, to citizens or business. All North Dakota law enforcement agencies, private sector businesses operating the state are hereby directed to recognize any North Dakota driver's license or North Dakota voter, motor vehicle registration uh, that, are, that are still in, still, uh, within their time period, but we also are asking anybody to recognize driver's license and motor vehicle registrations, uh, even if they've expired on or after March of March 1 of 2020. Uh, so this order effectively, if your driver's license uh, ran out the other day and you're worried or you got a family member that's sick and you didn't want to come in or weren't able to conduct that online, uh, your driver's license is still valid today as is your motor vehicle registration. So again, that uh, that will is valid and current as long as this executive order is in effect and the executive order will remain in effect until the emergency ends. So this is an example of things that we can do to relieve burdens on citizen and also reduce uh, uh, contact. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, take a, a, a short break here uh, and I'm going to uh, invite uh, Molly Howell, who's the North Dakota Assistant Director of De Disease Control, uh, to, to, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, how we do contact tracing. I know we had a number of, of questions about this in the past. Uh, she's one of the uh, great uh, hardworking experts that we have within the Department of Health, and, and so we'll let her do that. And then when I come back, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some new, fresh announcements around uh, uh, SBA loans. Uh, but here's Molly. Molly? Thank you, Governor Burgum. Uh, thank you for having me today. I just wanted to start off by thanking all of the epidemiologists and disease investigators that have been working really hard even prior to seeing cases of COVID-19 in preparing and planning to see cases. And also I want to say thank you to their family members because they maybe haven't seen their uh, spouses in a while. And thank you to the family members for taking care of the household and also the children in the household during this. And then we also have had local public health departments and our Health professional schools also offer to help us do case investigations, which we plan on taking them up on that in the very near future. So today I just wanted to talk about uh, what happens when uh, we get a report of someone who tested positive for the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, what that means at the Department of Health and that, what that means for the public and how we handle that. And so uh, we get uh, positive lab reports electronically. So as soon as it's positive at the lab, that is immediately sent electronically to the Division of Disease Control. And also the health care provider is one of the first people notified of the positive result. Then an epidemiologist from the Division of Disease Control uh, contacts that individual, which we're calling a case, and uh, interviews that individual. The interviews so far have been taking up to an hour. Uh, as a part of that interview, we're gathering information from the person, uh, including basic demographics, but also what symptoms they've had, um, where they went in the 14 days prior to becoming sick, so we can try and identify the source of the illness, and then also where they've been, if they've been anywhere since they've been sick, and that's so we can identify close contacts or areas of concern that we need to follow up on. We also get their employment, if they attend school, anything like that. Um, uh, and then when we identify close contacts, and so a close contact is anyone that's within six feet for a prolonged period of time, and at the Department of Health, we're using about 15 minutes. Um, and a close contact can occur if you're living with someone, so all household contacts are considered close contacts but also if you're riding in a car with someone for a prolonged period of time, if you're working closely in an office with someone for a prolonged period of time. 
A close contact is not if you're in the same restaurant as somebody else that might have COVID-19. And so if you were eating across the table with someone with COVID-19, you would be identified as a close contact. But if you were just in the same restaurant, you would not be identified as a close contact. And so then we follow up with all those close contacts. And then we ask them questions about if they're symptomatic, we advise them to stay home for two weeks. That would be the minimum time period from the last time they were exposed to somebody with COVID-19. If they have symptoms, those individuals are being referred in for testing. We don't want them to go right to the healthcare provider for testing. And so we are coordinating that with the healthcare providers so they know someone that was a contact to a case is coming in for testing and they're aware of that and can take appropriate precautions so we don't spread illness in the healthcare facility. Uh, we follow up with these individuals and monitor the contacts and the cases. The cases are monitored the entire time they're contagious, which is seven days after their onset of symptoms and they have to be fever free and feeling better uh, the fever free is 72 hours fever free without the use of meds and their symptoms have to be feeling better so the minimum time period is seven days after onset but it can be longer if they still have a fever so we follow up with the contacts and the cases and check for symptoms and make sure they're staying home and then um, we answer any questions that they might have or provide education we have fact sheets that we give cases and contacts so they know how to prevent transmission in the household if through our investigation, we identify uh, that someone was on an airplane with COVID-19, we notify the Centers for Disease Control and they provide us with close contacts that were on the airline for us to follow up with. If anyone was in a ride share, we follow up with ride share organizations and they tell us who the close contacts are and we follow up with those individuals. So I guess the basic message I wanted to say, if you're a close contact to somebody who's been positive for COVID-19, you will receive a phone call from the North Dakota Department of Health or the local public health department notifying you that you're a close contact. And then we will inform you of what steps you need to take next. Uh, the reason I wanted to share this with everyone today is there's a lot of rumors on the internet, uh, a lot of uh, social media posts about restaurants or places where cases might have been um, but really we will notify everyone if you were a close contact if you are identified through our case investigation if it's a school or a daycare we'll work with the school or daycare we'll send letters out to all the parents and so I hope um, this makes the public feel better about what we're doing to try to reduce the spread of coronavirus in North Dakota thank you Molly uh, Molly will be available for questions uh, at the end. Uh, next up is uh, uh, SBA loans. Uh, as you know, uh, one of the other work streams that we have going on with our whole of government approach uh, is to bring together all the different organizations and state agencies that have uh, an impact on economics in the state, and that w would be uh, include uh, everybody from our you know Department of Ag, our Department of Congress, the Bank of North Dakota. Uh, workforce insurance, unemployment. Uh, we've got all the leaders uh, working together uh, to try to make sure that we, we're calling our Economic Resiliency Task Force to coordinate uh, information about COVID-19 and make it easy, easy access for North Dakota employers and businesses. Uh, the tax department, the insurance department, you know, Department of Labor and Human Rights, Greater North Dakota Chamber, local regional chambers, economic development organizations are also uh, part, of, part of this organization. Department of Commerce uh, is taking the lead. Uh, and since Monday, uh, on Monday, they launched a one-stop employer research page combining information across all these organizations. So if you're an employer, a small business owner, an entrepreneur, uh, again, the North Dakota Department of of commerce uh, is the place to go for your one stop for all this information. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, we we had a, a, a call earlier this week with over a thousand participants. Uh, that included presentations from the leaders from all these different groups. There's a recording of that call that's available uh, on the Commerce Department's dedicated COVID-19 business and employer research page. Uh, and again, the great information from those leaders that's out there if, if employers missed that Thursday call, and we'll be having another one uh, next week. Uh, one of the things uh, that we did talk about during that call 
uh, was uh, urging employers who experience or anticipating financial strain uh, to, uh, to uh, prepare to apply for disaster loan assistance through the Small Business Administration. Uh, that was, I guess, just on Wednesday. Since that time, North Dakota has been approved uh, to begin sub submitting applications, and the SBA site is now uh, receiving applications. So, uh, so we believe, and that's just very current, we got an email at the state of North Dakota at 1.20 this afternoon saying it would be live in an hour. Uh, we'll follow up with that, but it should be, the site should be live now. That's the SBA site, disasterloan.sba.gov. Uh, is the uh, place to go. Uh, anyway, you can uh, find out information there again, or just go straight to our Department of North Dakota Department of Commerce site, and we can redirect. But this is a seven billion dollar uh, fund for low interest loans, up to two million dollars per business to cover working capital, operating experience, operating expenses, and more. But as this was set up, as for this first tranche, it's a first come, first serve. We urge anybody who's thinking of applying uh, for an SBA loan uh, to apply now, and you can find that and other disaster-related financial resources at at uh, nd.gov. Uh, that concludes the SBA portion. The last uh, thing we had questions the other day, I've got an update on rest areas in North Dakota. Uh, rest areas were closed uh, earlier uh, this uh, week. Uh, our intention, because uh, we understand the importance for uh, how important transportation is and the uh, folks that are out there with uh, commercial driver's license uh, delivering food, uh, you know, supplies, medical supplies, it's important to keep that going. And uh, and so all of our rest areas, uh, while the buildings still remain closed uh, this week, our intention is uh, that they will be reopened next week. Uh, the Department of Transportation is conducting deep cleaning. Uh, and sadly, we're also having to uh, do a bunch of repairs uh, because there was vandalism uh, at the rest area sites. Uh, this included people using crowbars to try to access uh, storage areas. Uh, apparently the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, demand for toilet paper uh, was so high that people felt they had to take to criminal activity uh, to try to access that. It's super sad and I hope that that is, uh, uh, we'll, we'll make the assumption that that was somebody passing through our state and not a uh, caring North Dakotan who cares about their neighbors. But again, uh, we, we, are, we intend to open those up. Uh, we are, uh, we're working to add additional uh, custodial and janitorial services to make sure that they've got regular cleaning. Uh, people should still uh, make sure that they're practicing their own uh, hygiene and hand hygiene uh, whenever they come into contact with public buildings. Uh, but we're gonna work to get those open. In the meantime, uh, the parking lot areas do remain open to the public. So if you need a chance, uh, uh, to uh, take a break when you're driving or truckers uh, that might need a rest area overnight. Uh, the parking lots are open and the buildings will reopen again next week. Uh, one other thing I want to uh, address uh, too is uh, relates to uh, when we talk about uh, misinformation, there was rumors flying all over the country today uh, that somehow there was going to be a presidential uh, you know, order about uh, mobilizing the National Guard nationally. Uh, we heard the president uh, say today uh, around noon in his uh, noon central time in their press conference uh, that that was not gonna happen. Uh, Adjutant General uh, Alan Dorman, uh, who is also the Director of Emergency Services for the state of North Dakota and part of the part of the cabinet, uh, General Dorman uh, was on a call at three o'clock today, just an hour before this uh, call uh, with the uh, Secretary of Defense and all the adjutant generals from around the country. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that is, uh, is not happening. Uh, and so uh, uh, it was said that, uh, quote from that call, it makes much more sense to leave them under state control so they can be mobilized as needed one piece at a time. That was from uh, General Engel said that uh, during this call. And again, uh, the president said, we are working with the governors. Uh, he referenced his governor's calls, which they're having uh, at least twice a week. I don't think that we'll ever find that necessary. So again, we'd like to squash that rumor. Uh, and people know that uh, the, the National Guard continues to be a key component of our emergency response, but they remain uh, under the direction of the governors of this country uh, as we uh, we and every other governor through the National Governors Association. We had a National Governors Association call the other day uh, and uh, Larry Hogan, who's the leads the Governor Association, governor from Maryland, uh, was uh, echoing that on behalf of all the governors and as chair of Western Governors, I can assure you that all the Western governors uh, are in also in agreement uh, that National Guard should remain uh, under the authority uh, managed under the 
authority of governors and not move to uh, the federal government. So let's uh, squash that one. Now we're going to go to uh, squash that rumor. Let's go to uh, questions. And Jack? Uh, do you have a theory, Governor, why so many cases in Burley Ward compared to other uh, counties in the state? Uh, the question was, do I have a theory about uh, about why so many cases in Burley Morton versus others. And rather than me conjecture a theory, I might look to Molly, and then Molly will have to either answer or not answer based on what we do share or don't share relative to personal uh, information. But uh, Molly, if you wanna if, step up here, if you got a theory about why, why we're. Yeah, I don't, it's not a theory. I, I'm trying to think how I can answer your question with trying not to identify individuals. Uh, so we've had a number of cases in the area that traveled, most of our cases have traveled out of state, and that's the reason for their illness in the Burley-Morton County area. But we also do have community spread. Now. Yes, but there is community spread, so, um, but the majority have traveled out of state, and then, of course, there has been some community spread. Uh, the third largest county in the state still has no confirmed cases at this point. It's at Grand Forks County. Is there testing available there in the way that there is in Burley County, Morton County, uh, Cass County, and, and everywhere else that there have been confirmed cases? Uh, question was the third largest county still has no reported cases, and that would be Grand Forks County. And further question was, did they have the same access to testing resources as the rest of the state? Uh, and the answer is yes, that they do. Uh, and I and I'm uh, certain that they're at least of yesterday. I think we had 30. We had tests submitted from 32 different counties, and I'm certain that they were part of that 32. Dave, you mentioned low interest loans from the SBA. What is the interest rate? Uh, I, the question was uh, that I mentioned low interest loans from the SBA, what is the rate? Uh, I don't actually know what the rate is. Uh, I know that we're in unprecedented times here because uh, it was, I guess, a week ago, just last Sunday, uh, Federal Reserve, you know, lowered the federal funds rate to zero for the first time in uh, modern history, maybe the entire history since they were, Fed, Federal Reserve was formed in 1914. We'd have to go back and look, but uh, I'm given the, uh, the bipartisan approach to try to uh, support uh, small businesses, uh, I, that number is going to be, uh, I'm going to say it's going to be very low. I mean, it, it's going to be, I mean, we're, we're looking at historic low interest rates and we may be in a period, uh, again, uh, where uh, lower than we've ever seen uh, as we try to work our way through this economic uh, crisis. Okay, the number just came in 3.75. That doesn't sound that low to me. I'm going to say that that number is uh, uh, is is will likely be uh, adjusted down. The federal government, if you're talking about writing checks, they're considering giving a check to every American. Uh, I don't think that uh, policy-wise that that would make any sense for us to be charging a an interest rate that's substantially higher than than uh, the Fed's fund rate through the SBI. But you know, we we. Uh, We'll continue to provide feedback to our federal partners in that regard, uh, but I, I would think that it is uh, low, low as low as could be when you're talking about federal government uh, issuing those loans would be the right policy right now. Dave, follow-on question. Because a restaurant owner in Fargo suggested to at least a couple of members of the media today that maybe the state could use the legacy fund to do bridge loans, especially for restaurateurs. A uh, question uh, uh, came up, uh, it was framed with, from a restaurant owner in Fargo, uh, was could the state use the legacy fund uh, as a possibility for low interest bridge loans for restaurant tours? And, and again, I wanna separate you know, policy from the source of where the money may come, because I think uh, one, of the, one of the big buckets of money that uh, the citizens of North Dakota have come to know is this, uh, our, essentially our endowment fund for our future, you know, called the legacy fund. Uh, the earnings off the legacy fund uh, today by statute come into the general fund and, and are used uh, to help fund general government. I think the, the opportunity for us to do uh, loan programs out of our bank in North Dakota, one thing that we have that no other state has is a, is a, is a state bank. And so it's more, more likely and, would, and potentially could loan programs, low interest loan programs to help businesses could come out of the bank in North Dakota 
Minnesota without uh, any legislative action because the bank could decide to do that. So separating the policy from where the source of the money comes, uh, the first and fastest place we could uh, look to uh, would be uh, would be the Bank of North Dakota for potential loan options and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of ideas uh, around this and I think there's going to be special consideration because you know this is the first time where, where the state has asked businesses to close I mean we're directly responsible we're asking them to uh, to undergo some economic uh, challenges uh, to help us you know solve a health care crisis and therefore because we've asked them to do that we were probably under more responsibility to find ways to help them on the backside Brent, anything you wanted to add to that, or Just thumbs up from uh, Jack? Uh, question for Molly about uh, close contacts. Just wondering if you can say how many people have been identified, have any um, been, been tested positive for, for COVID-19? Uh, the question was uh, for the close contacts, how many have been identified and have they been tested and been positive? I will take the second part of that because it's easier. Uh, yes, we have had close contacts that have been tested and have tested positive of cases. So that's included in the case counts. Um, in part of the number of individuals currently monitoring, those are contacts to confirmed cases of COVID-19. Um, some of those in the currently monitoring are also people who have traveled to North Dakota from the level three countries that have warnings that we're notified of, but the vast majority in the currently monitoring are close contacts. Uh, a question from Renee Jean um, with the Wilson Herald at Wilson's Online. She's wondering about ventilator capacity. Um, where are we at? What steps are taken to expand ventilator capacity in North Dakota? Okay, question coming in from the Williston Herald about uh, ventilator capacity and where we are uh, in terms of steps to increase ventilator capacity. And uh, same update as I have yesterday, we've got a, a dynamic uh, infographic that's posted on the healthcare site that shows uh, number of ventilators in the state uh, by geographic location uh, and then also the uh, those that are in the supply chain where we we know that there are some health organizations that have made made requests uh, we heard today in the uh, the white house press briefing uh, that through the defense production uh, act that was uh, enacted earlier this week uh, where the federal administration is going to be working with industry to try to increase uh, production of ventilators i think i saw a number and that came out of that as like twenty thousand nationally uh, there is also uh, a work stream that we're pursuing here in state uh, to try to find out about uh, retrofitting uh, ventilators that may exist to be able to use that might have been used for uh, anesthesiology for example post elective elective surgery uh, other states uh, it's been recommended nationally uh, that elective surgeries uh, cease that's been a national recommendation here we're letting uh, individual healthcare organizations uh, make that decision because with only two hospitalizations they may still have the capacity to proceed with electives for a while but at some point if we come become capacity constrained uh, then that may go from a recommendation to more of a mandate, uh, but that would free up additional capacity as well. But we do have, as part of our Unified Command Task Force, we've got people that are working the, uh, that, are, that continue to work on ventilators, ventilator access and ventilator supply chain is one of the key components. But I'd say we've, our team's got a handle on it right now and we're gonna try to uh, keep, keep, growing that, keep growing that number, but again, Capacity, it's do we have beds? Yes, we got beds. And if we don't have enough beds, we can convert facilities uh, that can be made into beds. Uh, general Dorman and I had a call uh, earlier today uh, with a general uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers through the FEMA declaration that was given yesterday. The Army Corps of Engineers has been asked and given an assignment in our region to help stand up uh, temporary hospitals. So ideas that we've talked about here earlier about would you, could you convert a uh, university dorm uh, to beds that could be used or could we take a, a rural critical access care hospital uh, and convert that entirely to a, a COVID facility. Uh, those are the kinds of exactly the kinds of things that uh, the, the general from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, both has got funding and personnel uh, 
in equipment that they could come in and try to stand them up. I mean, they, they even, you know, talked about putting them up in gymnasiums, but uh, we probably have got better solutions than that with the uh, dorms or critical access care hospitals. But there is work coordination between the states and the feds coming through FEMA, through Army Corps of Engineers, and, and our state unified command uh, to try to identify potential sites if we need to get that. So we take care of beds, take care of ventilators, and as we said earlier through the executive orders, we're trying to make sure we got the right supply of of healthcare workers, but then when we're protecting those that are most vulnerable, it's not just with underlying health diseases and people that are elderly, it's also our healthcare workers. And so we have to make, you know, take special care that we're protecting those uh, because other places uh, that have seen the spikes like Italy, healthcare workers start getting COVID, then they're sidelined. And when they're sidelined, then, then you know, how do you backfill that? So again, we have to always, when we're talking about the definition of those most vulnerable, we're talking about taking care of our healthcare workers. So working all those streams, beds, ventilators, and healthcare workers to make sure we're trying to avoid the spike happening, but if it comes, uh, we want to be ready. Follow-up on the ventilator question. Um, on this graphic on the website, it has uh, 286 ventilators listed statewide. There's been a distinction in the past between ventilators that are available right now for COVID patients versus total ventilators that could eventually be used for that purpose. Are these 286 ventilators able to be used right now for COVID-19 patients? Uh, I won't repeat the entire question, but I, I love the precision of the question, uh, Jeremy. And it was, uh, he's got the website up in front of him. He says there's 286 uh, ventilators on there. And the question is, are those the ones that are available right now or are those the ones that could be available? Uh, and, and if you're having to ask me that question, then I would tell you that we need to have better a better label on that graph. So we'll update the graph so that anybody that looks at it will have that answer. Uh, Governor, a quick one and then a longer one. Uh, rest areas opening up next week. Is that Sunday or Monday? Uh, they're going to open up uh, on a rolling uh, basis, and, and so when we say next week, I think the first ones are going to start opening on Monday, uh, but they're going to roll as they're able to complete these repairs uh, from the vandalism. And uh, other states and cities are announcing uh, the seek shelter policies. Uh, reports say that Minnesota is just a matter of time before they announce theirs. What conversations are happening in your office, and what's the latest on the thresholds to announce that kind of thing? Question was about other states that are that are uh, enacting uh, the shelter at in place or shelter at home uh, policies uh, that you've seen coming out of areas where we've had the highest number of outbreaks uh, in New York and California uh, specifically, uh, and the. And it's, and it was suggested that Minnesota was thinking about it uh, and in what kind of conversations are we having here uh, as we think about uh, our response to this uh, that's you know ultimately one of the places that we have to consider uh, but again i think that one of the reasons why that gets put in place is that in, in other places where you see escalating amounts of government mandates is when it's in reverse perhaps to what i'll call uh, the what we're asking for and have always asked for in terms of individual responsibility if everybody in our state uh, was practicing social distancing if everybody was uh, doing all the recommendations that are we giving then we wouldn't need to we wouldn't need to put mandates or requirements or existing executive orders because it would all just be happening uh, but uh, what happens is uh, start complying and then they might see their neighbor, their competitor not, and then we start getting the calls and saying, hey, you know, you folks have got to decide uh, centrally to make a decision, but we're going to just continue to make an appeal to everybody uh, for a state that prides itself in individual responsibility and people that want to have their freedom is let's, if we want to preserve our freedom, let's use it wisely, uh, which is uh, make sure that we're acting in the best interest of all North Dakotans and not just in, in a person's own self-interest. So, uh, you know, so all options are, are on the table. And again, if you, you know, want to see what's coming, uh, when you don't control the spike, when you don't have a flat curve, when you have a steep curve, the steeper the curve, uh, then the, the more drastic the responses have to be made by governments to try to reduce uh, social, uh, you know, reduce contact, reduce the spread, uh, increase the social distancing. And those two things go hand in hand. So we're, every day is a judgment call here. Every day we're making decisions on, on incomplete information. Uh, and every day we're trying to balance the interests of the, the, the citizens of North Dakota, both their, their health and their economic health, their education, uh, 
there's a lot of a lot of things that we're trying to balance here. But but again, I just would ask that uh, if people can practice what we're doing, maybe we can uh, have more days like today where we we uh, where, where we're not seeing a doubling uh, of cases. But uh, we have to assume that there's more cases out there than what the tests are producing. So that's another piece of incomplete information that when we're making these decisions. Maybe a quick follow up then, Governor. Uh, if every day is a reevaluation. Gauge for me your level of concern with how steep that curve is right now. The question was, if every day is reevaluation, then uh, what would be my personal view of concern or where we are? Uh, I think that we have to take uh, very seriously uh, the numbers that we're seeing uh, in other that are coming out of other states. We have to we we can't assume. Uh, I think some people might have assumed, hey, well, that's China. That's happening in China. Oh, that's South Korea. If you've never been to China or South Korea, probably seems like someplace that's a long ways away and maybe doesn't apply to us. And then, well, oh, it's New York and it's L.A. Well, that's a long ways away, and those are big metro areas. It doesn't really apply to us. I mean, if we take a path of of denial about that it, can't, it cannot happen here, then we are uh, – ignoring the science and ignoring the basic underlying fundamentals of how pandemics work uh, because uh, as I said at one of the earlier conferences it was you know one person that traveled to the state of Washington uh, from China that now has led to over a thousand cases uh, in the state of Washington and, and, and over half the deaths in the country came from that one state. If that person had traveled you know, to Bismarck or Fargo or Grand Forks instead of traveling to Seattle, we'd be on the front page right now. It, it doesn't necessarily have to have started at the coast. It started where the first people that were carrying it began. That's how pandemics work. We just got lucky that we weren't we weren't the front lines, but if that person had taken another couple plane legs and 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 landed here, uh, we we could have, we could have been Kirkland. Very easily could have been Kirkland. So we cannot uh, live in some world where you know we're in denial that somehow the geography of distance um, protects us. It was really a random luck that we did not have have somebody that came here with it right away. I mean, so we got extra time to prepare, but with that extra time to prepare, that doesn't mean extra time uh, to try to just uh, continue to reinforce the denial that pandemics don't spread everywhere. The only reason they don't spread everywhere is when you stop travel. And so we're probably also ought to be thanking, you know, the other states that got it first that are reducing travel because we've got less people traveling from there to here. So that also buys us more time. So if we, if we come out of this better than anybody else, it'll be, because social distancing policies were put in aggressively in other places. And somebody might say, oh, well then, you know, you went too far in North Dakota. Well, I, did we or did we not? Because we maybe are being saved here because of aggressive social distancing policies by other states and other locations that were experiencing higher breakouts. In the end, it's a it's a it's a math game, and, and we're uh, we're trying to win we're trying to win the math game by uh, spreading the rate of infection by lowering the rate of infection. That's what we're trying to do. Um, so okay, we have one more coming in from out from on the uh, the online questions. Uh, Chris Larson with uh, AM eleven hundred the flag out of Fargo. In the beginning, you were looking for better data set whereupon to make decisions. Uh, we're almost at a thousand tests. Do you think it's a more accurate representation, or is there a threshold or a number of tests that you're looking at to make good decisions off of data? Question was, uh, when we started, we said we want to be data driven. Now we're almost at a thousand tests. Uh, what kind of data sets would we be looking for? How do we feel about the data? Well, anyone that's been you know involved in statistics understands that you got to have a large enough sample to be statistically significant. And one thousand out of seven hundred sixty thousand. Uh, North Dakotans is not enough. I mean, that's not a statistical sample of, of uh, you know, percentage of our of our population to to try to make broad decisions. And we know that the data. We one thing we know about the data of testing is that data is lagging, and the data is lagging, meaning that we, if someone was sick three or four days ago and then they felt bad, then they got screened, then they got a test, then the test comes back, to, you know, eight or 24 hours later. Uh, there's a lag to that. So when we, when we said we were sure there was community spread, we said that before we had confirmation of that. When we say that there are you know, no confirmed cases in some of our larger counties, uh, as a, if I was gonna make a bet, I would guess that there are cases in those counties, they just haven't been confirmed yet. Uh, and so, so, the, so the testing data is not gonna solve the problem for us because it's always gonna be, gonna be lagging. Uh, what we uh, 
can only do then in this situation is, is and again, the more tests you have, the more tests you have in the denominator, then the lower the mortality rate becomes. If you test everybody, uh, you know, test everybody in the world, uh, you'd come up with a lower mortality rate. If somebody says the mortality rate is the number of people who who died versus the number of people who took the test, the mortality rate's going to look higher than if it was the number of people who died versus all the people who had it, including those who were tested and those who were not tested. But even with that, in the absence of that, all the data would show that this could be five times more deadly for elderly people than the flu. And so if we have something that's still unknown, still uncertain, uh, then we have to uh, act. Part of our job in government is to, you know, number one thing we do is the health and safety and welfare of the people of the state of North Dakota. So uh, we're continuing to search for uh, stronger data sets, uh, but in the meantime, we get to make decisions every day without complete data sets. The data we have is latent, uh, and so we can look to data from other states it's not North Dakota data, but we can look at the curves of those other states and we can see the increase, we can see the doubling, we can see the community spread, and you can project that we are not different from those places because the virus doesn't discriminate on geography. It discriminates based on whether it has contact with another person it can pass itself to. And so if it doesn't discriminate on geography, then we are not different from Italy or New York or California where they've had steep climbs. And, and if we don't have a steep climb here, it will because of the heroic action of people actually executing on social distancing. That will be the reason why it doesn't come here. You and Island have given uh an update on a shortage of swabs a couple of days ago that was sort of the holdup in testing. Um, can you give us an update on that and talk about sort of um, this potential deal with South Dakota to swap supplies? I know that things have changed there as well. I can give you an update on South Dakota, but my Lynn is here. Is there uh, anything on swabs you may want to either uh, either come forward or uh, or share? But on the, the South Dakota deal, uh, we were talking about they were short of reagents. Uh, we had some. Re we had. Uh, we were short of swabs. We thought about swapping swabs for reagent. Uh, in our talk between the two health departments, we decided that that was not going to work out uh, between the two. Uh, I know that Governor Nome. Uh, on the uh, call with the president and vice president made a, a sp specific ask for more reagent. I know the federal, uh, the federal agencies were working with her to try to solve that problem in South Dakota. So we think that, uh, that the South Dakota problem got solved with the, uh, with either national testing organizations or federal support. Uh, and then as you've seen here in the numbers, uh, we've uh, you know continued to ramp up our testing uh, and we'll continue to ramp it up. Uh, and so I'll let uh, uh, Mylin, our state health officer from North Dakota, talk about the swab situation. On the swab situation, we had some really good news and it came in right before I got here that South Dakota is offering us a thousand swabs and they're, um, we're in the process of picking them up right now. In addition, the federal government has let us know through the Secretary Alex Azar that we're getting 4,000 more swabs and they should be arriving today or sometime this weekend. So the issue around swabs I think is being relieved and being met. Um, in addition, the FDA is working to allow for some different testing methods and so we're just getting that information right now as I was sitting in the back of the room, I, I saw that come in. So our, our team will take a look at that and then let our providers know what other options there may be. You know, they got reagents, so we are not at this time. Is there anything that's being exchanged? Right now, no. There's nothing being exchanged. South Dakota met some of our needs. Before we go to the next question, I was just saying there was somebody online that said that uh, when we have a con goes on, when these go an hour long, that it should be like a basketball game, so there at least should be one time out so Lindsay can take a break. Uh, but she's just I just want to say that that uh, uh, she's the fastest signer in North Dakota. I think she's been keeping up with me all week, and I want to thank her for uh, for doing that. And uh, apparently, she's got great stamina. Uh, okay, next question. I can do one more. Okay. Um, so you mentioned these unemployment claims. Are they coming from any particular part of the state or any industry that you notice? Obviously, we've seen really harsh effects on the oil and gas industry. 
Yeah. The question was where are the unemployment claims coming from, and we've seen uh, impacts on oil and gas. That's very precise. When they come in, they do get categorized by industry. Uh, in this, uh, the numbers that I shared earlier, 600 on Wednesday, 1,600 yesterday. Uh, the the whole wave of those is, is coming from. Uh, the energy industry is where that first wave is coming. I'm guessing that we'll see hospitality and uh, retail and, uh, you know, restaurant. That'll start showing up next week. Uh, but right now the first wave was, first wave was oil and gas. And I see Darren, Darren Brostrom over there who's our uh, unemployment uh, expert and in terms of administrating in North Dakota. Anything you want to add to that or did I, uh, did I get that one right? Okay. He says we got it covered all right we're double checking but uh thank you darren for being here and thanks for for the, all the work that everybody is doing as you guys face this crunch over in the uh in job service unemployment claim area another question coming in online um so this is from the forum have we considered a moratorium on evictions from rental properties in north dakota uh question was have we uh, considered a moratorium on evictions from rental property in north dakota and i would say i know that that's uh been discussed in meetings that I've been in. I don't think we are announcing anything today. I think I might have said yesterday uh, that uh, I know on a national level, uh, Secretary uh, Carson uh, from uh, HUD uh, was uh, had indicated that there were going to not be any. Uh, I don't know if it was you know Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, whatever, but on the federal level, I think they put a moratorium in on federal housing. Uh, but I, I know that that's uh, one of the things that's under discussion. And I don't know if there's other uh, experts in the room that have an update on that or not. We'll just take that one as a, uh, 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 we'll take that one as they get back to you with more information. Last one, I promise. Have the testing criteria changed at all over the last few days? Has the testing criteria changed over the last few days? Being able to get okay. Molly, you want to take that one? Okay. So, uh, the testing criteria is really based on local supplies because at the state right now we do have the reagents to do the testing and we are keeping up. And so if in local areas there are shortages of say swabs, they can prioritize patients who are hospitalized, those living in congregate settings such as long-term care facilities, healthcare workers, and then people identified through our investigations that we identify as contacts that are symptomatic if they have a local shortage of, say, swabs. Um, and that guidance went out to healthcare providers on March 18th and is posted on our website. Other questions? Hearing none. Uh to close out today again, uh, want to close out with with again thanking uh, all the the important role that the media is playing here. I want to thank all of our state agency leaders uh, that are working so diligently around the clock to try to deliver solutions. I want to thank all of our mayors uh, and their staffs and county officials because we've been in constant contact. We know there's a lot of work happening across the state uh, at that level. And of course, uh, if you've got uh, every mayor in North Dakota is a part time part-time position. They've all got other things they're doing. They're dedicated, uh, dedicated servants, as are the, all of their uh, city councilmen or city commissioners. So we appreciate what they're doing. Uh, the business leaders across the state that are, that are taking the uh, courageous acts to try to, uh, you know, help protect the public and their customers and their employees, even when they know that it's going to affect their bottom line. Uh, again, as, as a Former business owners, Brent and I, understand uh, the challenging and painful and maybe unprecedented decisions that people are having to make, but we, we thank everybody for that, uh, for all the work that they're doing. And again, in closing, we want to just thank you know, everybody that's focused on facts, not on fear. Uh, the way we get through this is we get through it together. Uh, we get through it by making sure that we're uh, acting on the best information we have, and we do it by making sure that we're being North Dakota smart. Uh, and with that, we can uh, save lives, uh, and we can educate our children, and we can uh, get through it and then we can get back to having one of the best economies in the world right here in North Dakota. We can get that all done hopefully in 2020. But uh, right now, uh, we're still at the front end of this thing. Uh, we're, it's, we're still in a, a point where we would expect that we're going to continue to see more cases, not less. And so all the, all the work that's being done on social distancing matters and really appreciate that. And again, practicing your own uh, great work, uh, you know, washing your hands, keeping your distance, stay home if you're sick. Uh, those are the, the big three things. 
that people can keep doing uh, that will actually literally help save lives. So thank you for being here today. And uh, for those in the, in the media, thank you guys for practicing. You're all today more than six feet apart. Way to go. Uh, and uh, that are in the room. Uh, and and uh, we'll uh, see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. Thank you.